Thank you for watching this online class presentation from Cedarville University. Students from every major can use their God-given talent to honor Him in nearly 10 musical ensembles, both instrumental and chorale. Teams perform on campus, across the country, and around the world, giving all the glory to God. We invite you to learn more at cedarville.edu. Song of Songs is a really Hebrew way of speaking. Uh, like Holy of Holies, Song of Songs means the very best song. Holy of Holies means the holiest spot. So let me just address right here at the very beginning, why in the world would anyone take marital advice from Solomon? Good question, right? I mean, seriously, uh, as someone who was the poster child for failure, and yet, in the very same way we take a look at Proverbs, and realize there's a lot of wisdom here, even, this, even though this guy was capable of being really, really foolish, he's also capable of citing wisdom and knowing what wisdom is. So we're going to take a look at Solomon's very best work. Um, I just warn you, though, that the uh, book, if it were made into a movie, would be rated R, as is uh, class today. Uh, we're actually going to talk about sex. Believe it or not, we really will. So. When we do, don't be surprised, I warned you, we're going to talk about it. Not that I want to go overboard or go deeper than the scripture does, but I want to say exactly what the scripture says. So, let's uh, head into it, and uh, here's where I would like to start. I want to take a look at this um, Bible, this study Bible, it's called a Net Bible. You may not have heard of it before, <clears throat> but it stands for the New English Translation. It is free on the internet. And it was one of the very best study Bibles for word studies, grammar, uh, and original language study. So everybody ought to have a good study Bible. This is not the complete study Bible, but it's my go-to first place I look at when I want to do a sermon or, or a lecture uh, when it comes to the grammar and the language. Now, that's really important for a book of poetry because poetry is often hard to translate to get the picture and the meaning together. So we're going to default to this translation an awful lot. Uh, you can even see here in the very beginning, uh, instead of saying Song of Songs, it again translates it really well, Solomon's most excellent song. And then verse 2, I think, in New American Standard or NIV, says something like, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. And when you first hear that phrase, you kind of wonder how that poetry translates, like, kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, what are the kisses he going to kiss me with, you know? And yet this translation, let him kiss me, oh, that you would kiss me passionately, is a, is a much more English way to say the phrase. So we're going to use this, and I just want you to see what we're looking at and have some confidence in the way it translates language. It's really, really the best resource. You ought to, you ought to get one. All right? So let's get right then to the history of Song of Songs. Where has it been? In some of the other books we've looked at, like Ecclesiastes, this was an important part of the tradition that the, the book brings with it, or the knowledge base, knowledge base that we bring with us. What, what is our perception of the Song of Songs? And you probably, you may have been exposed to one of these different kinds of interpretation. The first one, probably most popular, most historical, is that of an allegory. <clears throat> and what I mean is, that it's not really talking about what you think it's talking about, it's actually talking about Christ and the church. I can remember evangelists coming to our church and they would speak about Jesus and they would say he is quote unquote altogether lovely, which is a really clear phrase from the King James about the bridegroom in Song of Songs, but he was applying it to Christ, right? And so that kind of idea has persisted a lot for I think what might be fairly obvious reasons, right? Why would someone who's reading through this book think it's talking about Christ and the church? Well, you really wouldn't, right? Because as you read through, that's not what your mind first goes to probably. But if in fact sex is in any way unholy and we need to kind of help God out and sanctify the book, we can say that it's talking about something much holier than what it appears to talk about. Now, I don't want to be condescending, but let me say, I think even as well-intentioned as it is, I think that's a pseudo-spiritual approach that really avoids the real issues. This, uh, if they were talking about Christ the church, there could have been a much less distracting way to do so, don't you think? The second way is that of a celebration, and that is <clears throat> what we're doing here is celebrating uh, physical love, sex, in marriage. 
And I certainly don't disagree with that. It's, it's good, but if that's the point, what is the message? The message would be something like sex is good or fun, which is good. But my, my guess is that most of us would have guessed that already anyway, wouldn't you think? I mean, if, if that's the point, what does it add to what we already know or believe? And there's kind of very little there. So it's a legitimate message, but I think that's really a side issue. Right? So w what about the third option here? And that is a manual. And the very first time I encountered this book in a serious way, uh, in, a, in some Sunday school material, uh, the approach was that this was actually a manual, or this was how the Christian couple gets the job done, right? Like, so six easy steps. So when we're moving through the book, it's like, okay, it says his right hand is under me and his left arm is around me. This is the proper position. And my only response to that is, uh, Let's, let, let's go on, right? None, none of these, as well-intentioned as they might be, actually hit, hit the target or hit, get the point. So what, what, what is the book about? And I, and I think it's really important, really relevant, and uh, uh, hopeful for us, too. So let's start like this. First of all, let's meet the cast of this reader's theater or opera. Now, I call it that because... This is not a play which is to be acted out in front of an audience for obvious reasons. It would be, again, rated R or at least, right? Uh, but a reader's theater is one where actors sit on stools in uh, the front of the theater and orally interpret or speak the parts. And I think that's the kind of thing that we've got here. So there are a number of characters in the play. The first one, of course, is the groom slash husband. Now, I say that groom slash husband because it takes place over time. At some point, he is the groom, and then later on, they get married, and he is the husband. So like in any marriage, any wedding, you have to have one, uh, but he's hardly the focal point. No, nobody cares to look at him when he walks down the aisle, right? It's the bride that everybody focuses on, so let's go to her, the bride or the wife. Now, this is a place, again, where it's a really good idea to have a good study Bible. And the reason is because... As we said last time with wisdom and chokmah, that is a feminine word. Nouns, pronouns in Hebrew have gender. So that when you say, hey, you, in Hebrew, you're, you're, never, you're never saying, hey, you, generic. You're saying, hey, you, girl, or you, guy. So that when one person is speaking to another by the gender of the pronouns in Hebrew, you can tell who is talking. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't come through in our English translations, right? You, you don't know. So a good study Bible will tell you she is speaking, or he is speaking, or she is speaking, right? So um, when the wife speaks then, uh, this is actually her story that she tells <clears throat> for the benefit of the daughters of Jerusalem. These are the younger single girls in Israel. So if you saw the old um, Jennifer Garner movie, 13 going on 30, something like that, imagine the older woman saying to the younger girls in the slumber party, hey, uh, here's what marriage is like, and here's what I wish someone had told me when I was in your position. All right? So those are the major players in the story. Uh, before we dive into the text, let me make two quick notes. The first one is this one. I want you to stay with me to the very end. Right? Don't, don't, don't assume, don't say to yourself, Oh, I've been here for the Christian talk. I know how this turns out. I mean, you, you might, you might not. Like so many other books, most of the time when you leave class, you're thinking, didn't see that one coming, right? Or never saw that in the storyline. And, and it may be the same thing here. So stay with me all the way to the end. Also true that I've seen it. I can see it in people's eyes, right? This is a really emotional discussion. Uh, again, some of us are naive about it in a good way. Others are not and wish we didn't know as much as we do. And so there are some people who, when we start to talk about this, opens up old wounds, it's painful, and your mind just races to other things and you kind of zone out. Don't, don't do that, right? Stay with me and, and hear what she has to say. Uh, the second thing is this. The poetry is really powerful. And you're going to be really glad by the time we're finished that this book is all poetry. The poetry does for us things that the prose can't do. Uh, and sometimes it's inexact. Like, there are going to be places where, you know, it'll say, he's taken me to his banqueting hall, and his fruit is sweet to my taste, and his banner over me is love. 
right? And say, what does that mean? And I'll say, I'm not really sure exactly, right? It's kind of inexact. But here's, here's the good news. When you put the whole book together, the essential message is really clear. The, the big idea, the big theme is repeated three times, and there's a very definite progression from the beginning where she's talking to the girls about their marriage and then talks about their courtship, talks about their wedding, talks about their honeymoon, talks about conflict afterwards, and then their lives now. There's a, there's a very clear progression that helps us say to ourselves, yeah, we've really nailed what this book is talking about. So, um, even though I can't tell you what every verse means, when you take a look at the whole, uh, I'm pretty satisfied that this is exactly what the book is saying to us. So, let's take a look at it. And let's start out with uh, chapter 1, verse 1. Um, and I have changed the title here in the PowerPoint probably a little bit, always trying to tweak it, always trying to make it better, always trying to make it communicate a little bit better. So it might be different than what you have in your written notes. If it is, you, if you have time, you might want to kind of update a little bit. <clears throat> but here's what the basic theme is as she starts talking to the daughters in Jerusalem. She's talking about their joy in marriage and how we got there. So again, remember, she, the wife, is speaking to the daughters of Jerusalem and she's telling them about her conversations and her life with her husband. It's kind of like, and he said this, and I said this, and then he said this, and I said this, but it's all directed toward them, all right? So, the conversation between the wife and the daughters of Jerusalem, uh, chapter 1, verses 2 to 8, about being married. So she just, I mean, she just hits you right in the face from the very beginning and says, when I'm thinking about my husband, I say, man, I wish he would kiss me passionately, right? And so they, they just dive right in to the physical description of what their marriage is like and how much they enjoy being with each other. And so she says a number of things about him. He says the same things about her. The king is nuts about his wife. And she starts, he starts talking about how much he enjoys her. And you can just tell these people are madly, deeply in love by the way they speak to each other especially as she recites it to the daughters of Jerusalem. This conversation between the married couple then uh, starts to really heat up in verses 12 to chapter 2 and verse 6. And let me just uh, carefully choose the right verses to talk about here. Um, there are certain spots, you know, it's kind of like driving down the road and watching out for chuck holes and stuff. There are certain spots you just can't avoid them. We're just going to run right into them. But, but here I'm just going to start out slow so as not to shock you too much, right? Um, so in chapter 1, she'll say, verse 14, My lover is to me a cluster of henna blossoms from the vineyards of Engedi. Uh, he says, How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful your eyes are doves, in verse 15. Uh, 16, How handsome you are, my lover. Oh, how charming, right? So they're going back and forth. Um, celebrating one another. And she says, our bed is verdant or green. And so this is a part where the poetry is a little inexact. We don't know if she's talking about living together in their house and the bedspread is green or whether they are, you know, having a Saturday afternoon jaunt through the hike or something and they're in the woods. And she says, we're, we're laying down here in the grass. And verse 17 the beams of our house are cedars, our rafters are firs. Is she speaking figuratively? They're out in the woods, they're enjoying one of those company as they're on a hike. Or is she saying that in their house, right, the beams are firs and they're cedar. And the point is that it's a really sensual kind of thing. That is all the senses are excited. It feels good, it smells good, uh, it, it is good, and they're enjoying each other's company. As you get to chapter two, um, it gets a little more intense. Verse three. Like an apple tree among the trees of the forest is my lover among the young men. I delight to sit in his shade, and his fruit is sweet to my taste. He's taken me to the banquet hall, and his banner over me is love. Now, did anybody ever sing this in VBS? <laughs> Jesus, the rock of my salvation, his banner over me is love. Yeah, right. Well, if they really knew where this song came from, I don't think this is VBS appropriate. I'm just saying... <laughs> Again, I think it kind of goes back to that allegorical approach, right, where you would say, oh, it's really talking about Christ and the church, right? But the kind of things we're talking about here are <clears throat> uh, a little more mature. Uh, 
She says, strengthen me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am faint with love. So all the way through this, she has been talking about their marriage relationship, their physical relationship, even about being to the point where um, she, her, her blood pressure is up, she is faint with love, and she's really, really attracted to him. To go back to the Net Bible to kind of catch in our language, how this would sound to original Hebrews, oh, how I wish you would kiss me passionately. Right? Not just a peck on the cheek, I want you to kiss me passionately. Right? Um, his fruit is sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banquet hall and he looked at me lovingly. Again, we all know that. We've seen movies or seen it, unfortunately, in a dining hall where someone <laughs> has that look in their eye like, wow, he's really attracted to her or she to him, right? And you can tell it's not a normal look. It's a, one of those looks, right? Sustain me with raisin cakes. And she's like, ah, I'm kind of faint here. I'm about to pass out and, and, you know, I'm overwhelmed. And then finally here, refresh me with apples. I'm faint with love. His left hand caresses my head and his right hand, oh my goodness. Does it really say that? Answer, yes, it really says that. D did I not warn you we were gonna talk about sex? We are, he, he, they do, he does, she does, right? This is all of a sudden really, really uncomfortable and really, really serious and it's like, okay, I can't believe that's actually in the Bible. Yeah, it is, it is. Now, at this point, your response and my response is probably the same, I don't take any pleasure right, in trying to shock the audience. You don't take any pleasure in looking at it in a big group setting like this. But imagine what the daughters of Jerusalem felt like, right? They were probably like, oh, could we just stop? This is like <laughs> way too much information. I'm really glad you and your husband are like this, but that we don't want to hear any more, right? And so as you're reading through here, you say, is this wife, is she just kind of this clueless person who's going on here? Does she know what she's doing? And the answer is she is, she is dumb like a fox. She knows exactly what she's doing. She wants to get them to this point where they're like, oh, don't tell us anymore, right? And to shock us a bit and to say, okay, now I've got you right where I want you, right? It's as though she is saying, you wanted to hear about sex? Here it is. This is what it's about. This is what my relationship with my husband is like. And it's really, really good. But as soon as she gets right here to 2-6, just to the point where you say, no more, she says, okay, here's what I really want to say to you. Now that I've got your attention, here's what I want you to know. I adjure you, o daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles and by the wild does, do not arouse or awaken love until it pleases. Right? And so what she's saying basically is, this emotional and physical relationship we have is wonderful and it is good and it's intense, but don't you dare get involved in it until the right time. And the reason I know she says that is because as we take a look at the text, notice this. Again, here's our net Bible. Do not awaken or arouse love until it pleases. Now these are really critical words. And by the time we're all finished and you want to say, okay, what are the boundaries? What are the lines? It says it right here. Do not arouse love until the right time, until it pleases. Now, it does not mean until you feel like it. She's going to be really, really clear about the right time in a couple of chapters. But right now, let's focus on this statement, do not arouse love. And if you take a look at the um, footnote here in the Net Bible, it says in Hebrew, this could be translated, if you arouse or if you awaken love before it pleases, or a better paraphrase, promise that you will not arouse or awaken love until it pleases. This line is a typical Hebrew negative oath formula in which the speaker urges his or her audience to take a vow to not do something that would have destructive consequences. The expression, I adjure you, is used when a speaker urges his audience to take an oath. So what she's doing is saying, promise me, even though I've told you all about this, promise me you won't get involved in it until the right time. So in some sense, sort of back off. You with me here? So where we go next, I think, is this. Because my response to that, or at least when I was single and I would hear people say that, my response to that was, well, it's easy for you to say. 
You're married, right? What, what, what right does a married person have saying to a single person, don't get involved in the kind of stuff I'm involved in whenever we want to, right? And so she answers back then here uh, in the rest of this section, and she's basically going to say, <clears throat> it wasn't easy for us to not arouse love because we had every excuse to be physically involved, but we didn't, right? So she's saying, I'm not asking you to do anything we didn't do. That is, we were careful here. I'm asking you to do, uh, do it the way we did. So here is the way they did it, right? So she's saying, look, it, was, it would have been easy to get involved because he was physically attractive. I'm not going to go into the verses there, but verses 8 and 9, picture the groom like a deer or a gazelle. And if you've ever watched them in the wild, there's hardly anything that's more beautiful and powerful and coordinated and physically attractive, right? It's just beautiful. Uh, but even more importantly, he was romantically attractive, right? So she's saying, look, it was really tempting. Physically attractive, romantically attractive, but we didn't. Now, let me talk about what made him romantically attractive. And first of all, it is this. He initiated the relationship and invited me. So, verse number 10, my lover spoke and said to me, arise, my darling, my beautiful one, and come with me. And so he has these plans. He wants her to go on a trip with him. And so they, they take off and have an adventure. And then as we finish verse 13, arise, come, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. Now, uh, I said to you in the very beginning that some people think this is a manual. That is, it's an explanation of exactly how to get the job done. I don't think that's the point. Nevertheless, one could pick up a pointer or two. Guys, <clears throat> first thing he did was he initiated the relationship. He asked me out. Amen? Okay, all right. Generally, it's not a good idea to respond during this day, but yeah, there, there were heads nodding, and yes, this is a good thing, right? Number two, he desired to know me. Uh, verse 14, my dove in the clefts of the rock and the hiding places of the mountainside, listen to the words carefully here, show me your face, let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Now, not to make too fine a point here, but in a book which is not shy in talking about body parts, he, 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 he simply says, show me your face, let me hear your voice. When she's talking about when they were dating, this is what he's saying, right? He says, look, I want, he wants to know me. He just wants to see my face. He just wants to have a relationship with me. And they resolve to avoid conflicts, the little foxes that ruin the vines. Again, a guy who is not interested in a relationship doesn't care about irritations or conflicts, just brushes them over to get what he wants. Not here. He wants to develop the relationship, and so he says, let's avoid the conflicts. Let's talk it out if we're having issues. Uh, they were mutually committed to one another. I am his, and he is mine. Uh, you want to talk about what makes it difficult not to arouse love. If you think it's hard when you're dating, wait till you get to be engaged. Because when you're engaged, you say, this is the person I'm going to spend my life with, so why? And it become, the rationalization just becomes easier and easier, right? Uh, she, ver, the, the poetry in verses 1 to 4 is a little hard to understand, but I would simply say, paraphrase it like this, in high school I dated a lot of turkeys, but now I found a man, now I found this one, I've searched for him all the time, and I finally found this one, and all of these reasons put together make you want to say, wow, this is, it's time to arouse love, right? And, and what she says is, again, in 3.5, promise me, you will not arouse love until the right time. So you've got this big bracket, right, over this section. Do not arouse love until the right time. I'm not asking you to do anything we didn't do. Temptations were there, but we said no. And in the middle, you got a little couple of hints about, you know, how you get the girl. So, guys, there it is. So <clears throat> let's go on then and see where this takes us. And that takes us to the memories of the wedding day in verses 6 to 11. We know this is the wedding day because verse 11 says that it is. And in verse 6, she looks back on it and says, I remember the first time I saw him. I, I, his, his, his chariot was a long way off and I just saw this cloud of smoke going up behind him. And, and she's just recounting the day as though it was a wonderful, wonderful memory to look back on. Now you might think, well, duh, aren't all weddings like that? And the answer is no, they're not. 
Not all weddings are like that. I can tell you one that was not like that, and it goes back way deep in my childhood because I was in eighth grade. But I was a really, really naive, stupid eighth grade boy when my older sister got married. And I knew that it was kind of quick and it seemed a little unusual to me, but again, I was pretty naive. And uh, I remember that wedding day, and this was back in the day when the color of the dress actually meant something, and my sister didn't wear white. And I remember my mom and dad afterwards crying and thinking, you know, even this stupid eighth grade boy, uh, people cry at weddings, but those don't seem to be real happy tears because this wasn't the ultimate hope they had for their little girl, right? Um, five months later, I had a new nephew. Contrast that with eight years ago, my experience as the dad walking my beautiful, precious, most incredibly, unspeakably valuable daughter, walking her down the, wet, the, the wedding aisle to give her to a gorilla. <clears throat> <laughs> Nothing can prepare you for this experience. I, I love Adam. I love my son-in-law. He is a son to me. But walking down that aisle and just, just this, uh, your, your mind is racing like 300 miles an hour during this emotionally charged time. And one of the thoughts that just pops up out of nowhere was how proud I was of Christy and Adam for the way they had handled their, their dating and their engagement period. I was just so proud of them, and that's a wedding that I love to look back on, right? She says that's the kind of wedding that we had, which leads us then to the wedding night. So here we have the wedding night, chapter 4, 1 to 5, 2. If you paid any attention as you read the book, you know this is the intense part, uh, or one of the two intense parts. It's also, in a lot of ways, a pretty, <laughs> it's a pretty humorous part, right? Your hair is like a flock of goats to Cindy Mount Gilead. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, your teeth are like little sheep. Oh, right? <laughs> your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon. <gasps> <sighs> <laughs> Oh, uh, don't try it. It doesn't really work, okay? Uh, <laughs> it's an ancient culture. It probably worked for her, uh, but it, does, no, it doesn't work today, okay? <laughs> there must be other ways. That's not it. But the parts that are eternal, the parts that are valuable, the parts that do, that do speak to us are these parts, and I want to talk about those, like verse 9. It says, you've stolen my heart, my sister, my bride, right? So he's piling up these terms of affection and closeness, my sister, my bride. And then he says this, you are a garden locked up, my sister, my bride. You are a spring enclosed and a sealed fountain. And so she describes herself as this garden. And then she requests in the next couple of verses, um, verse 16, Awake, north wind, and come, south wind. Blow on my garden, that its fragrance may spread abroad. Let my lover come into his garden. And then in chapter 5, verse 1, he says, I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride. Now, the beautiful part here is this, that the poetry allows us to see only what we need to see at the wedding night in a clear and yet dignified way. Because we all know what just happened here, right? We all know exactly what happened, and, and what we've been able to do is to see the most intimate of human moments, the most holy of human moments, and know exactly what's going on, but the poetry kind of masks it a bit so that we can read about it and, in some sense, enjoy it. Nobody wants a prosaic, you know, uh, straightforward message about exactly what's going on here, right? The, the poetry is nice. But... Did you notice that in the poetry, as much as it is, is, is a bit of a veil, that it is also incredibly clear by the, by the repetition that we're given? And what I'm talking about is this. When she describes herself, she says she's a garden locked up, a spring enclosed, and a sealed fountain, right? Now, when you have like three different eyewitnesses looking at something and they all come away with the same uh, conclusion, you know, you've kind of got it. And as you look at this, there isn't anybody in the room who doesn't know what this means. 
before they come together, she's a garden locked up, she's a spring enclosed, she's a sealed fountain. So it is very clear when these two come together to make love, it is their very first time. So that's the message of the book, right? Answer, no. We're not nearly there yet. Hang on with me because what happens next is this. Since this is a Genesis 3 world and not a Genesis 2 world, I trust you understand what I mean by that, right? Since there is now sin involved, uh, we're going to have trouble no matter what, when two sinners marry. Even as good a people as they probably are, they're still sinners. So there must be conflict. There will be blood, and there's going to be bad blood. Yes, it's Taylor Swift, right? Isn't it? It's kind of funny, isn't it? It's going to be bad blood. Band-Aids don't fix bullet holes, you know. So there's a problem, and here is the problem, chapter 5 and verse 2. So here's the situation. She says, I slept, but my heart was awake, right? So she is in bed, the bedroom door is locked, and she is kind of in one of those hazy mental states where she's kind of asleep, but just a little bit awake. I slept, but my heart was awake, and I said, listen, my lover is knocking. So he's on the outside. He says, open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my flawless one. Now, read it carefully. Surely you can imagine what he's after, right? He doesn't just say, hey, open up the door. He says, open my darling, my dove, my flawless one. You know what's on his mind. My head is drenched with dew, my hair with the dampness of the night. And she says, well, I've taken off my robe. Must I put it on again? I've washed my feet. Must I soil them again? And again, you can read between the lines. You see what she's saying, right? He's knocking on the door and says, hey, I would like to come in and not just into the room, but in Right? And she says, mm, no, not going to happen tonight. I have a headache or whatever the excuse. I don't want to get out of bed and have to get my feet dirty. Right? And so like, oh man, we got conflict here because verse four, my lover thrust his hand through the latch opening, right? He's fiddling with the bedroom door. And she says, my heart began to pound for him. Right? So she's changing her mind. I arose to open for my lover. Um, verse 6, I opened for my lover, but my lover had left. He was gone. My heart sank at his departure. So he comes and says, hey, let's get together. And she says, no. And then she changes her mind. And by the time she gets to the door, he's taken off mad in a huff. So all of a sudden we have a conflict, right? Now, what happens next is she takes off and she goes looking for him. Again, the poetry is a little inexact, I'm not sure exactly what happens, but evidently she goes searching for him through the streets of Jerusalem and some of the guards catch her, don't know who she is, beat her up a little bit. You think, what, what is that? What's going on here? And I think the point is simply this, that one bad thing leads to another, the whole thing kind of spiraling down. And this is a place where this conflict could get really big, where she could say, you went off in a huff. And he says, but you didn't open the door. And she says, well, I came after you and, and the guards beat me up and it's not my fault. Well, if you hadn't gone off, you know, and you could just see this whole conflict getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But of course, the way this whole thing turns out, it doesn't. They, as the text says, they start to think about one another. They get together. And let me just finish this really quickly. In verse 12, it says, before I realize it, this is chapter six, Verse 12, before I realized it, my desire set me among the royal chariots of my people. The two are back together. She doesn't tell us exactly how they get back together. The point is that they do. And when they do, then the big lesson starts to come out because here is what happens. In chapter 7, 1 to 8, 3, we have the second really intense uh, discussion about each other's bodies, right? And so what happens here is the two solve their problems, they, they make up, they mature, and we have this really intense, I don't know if it's not exactly a lovemaking session, but the, the point is that, that this is just like it was in chapter four, except for one thing, and that's this, that this one's longer. And I think the message of the book is, you know what, these two are more in love in every way, and even physically, the further they go in life. And so even though the enemy might whisper monotony and monogamy, same thing, 
Here the story is the two, their love and their physical love gets more intense and um, better than it was even before. So I, I think we're ready now, first of all, for the first statement of kind of the big idea. The major point of her story now becomes clear. The kind of relationship which endures conflict, right? That's what we've just done from 5, 2 to 6, 13. The kind of relationship which endures conflict and continues to grow in this section is one that's founded on committed and informed relationship marked by physical restraint. And there she has it. Now, um, this is kind of the basic idea of the book. Are we right? Is this the correct way to understand it? Well, what we have here in this final word of counsel is something which kind of backs it up, reinforces it, and here's how it does it. She starts again in chapter 8 and verse 4 with that theme statement. I don't know if I mentioned it, but it's three times, right? 2, 7, 3, 5, and 8, 4. Promise me you will not arouse physical love before the right time. And the right time, of course, according to this book, is when they're married. Why? Well, here we finally get an answer. Because of the uncontrollable power of sexually charged love, which is what we have in verses 5 to 7. Let me just use one of the metaphors she uses. And she says this, Love is strong like a fire. It burns like a blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Many waters cannot quench love. Rivers cannot wash it away. And the point is simply this. The gift of physical love is supposed to be an uncontrollable gift. And, and the, the universal fallacy of most people is, well, we can kind of dabble in it and, and then control it. And God says, no, that's not the way that gift was designed. That gift was designed to be so powerful and so good that it consumes you. It's like fire that's in a furnace and it warms the house. You take the fire out of the furnace and it destroys the house. You can't control it. The only place for this kind of fire is in the furnace of a covenant relationship where it will be a blessing rather than a destructive force because you can't stop it over time. So then we have the understanding response of the daughters of Jerusalem. Now again, this is where the clarification especially comes because the daughters of Jerusalem say, okay, wait, wait, l l let's see if we get what you're saying here. Uh, we have a, a younger sister. What should we do uh, for her when she's spoken for, right? This is chapter eight and verse eight. We have a young sister. Again, I implore your maturity with me here. We have a young sister, her breasts are not yet grown. Like we have a little sister who's 10 or 11. Uh, what should we do for our sister for the day she is spoken for? That is, how do we prepare her during these early years so she's ready for her wedding day? And they say these words. If she is a wall, we'll build on her a battle of silver. If she's a door, we'll barricade her. So if she's a wall, we will build on her a tower, right? So a wall does not allow entrance. Uh, then we will encourage her because a battlement of silver or a tower of silver is this. When you have a two-dimensional wall, it's pretty easy for that wall to fall over. But if you take a three-dimensional tower, build it into the wall, you give it real strength and stability, right? So the point is, if she is a wall, we will encourage her. We will say to her, you go, girl, right? Well, I know what the rest of the culture does, but you're, people may laugh at you, but you're doing exactly the right thing, and we want to encourage you to do the right thing. If, in fact, she is a door, though, and what do doors do? Doors are loose. Doors allow entrance. If she's a door, we will barricade her, right? We will do whatever we have to do to keep her from being loose. We'll go on dates with her until she's 30 if we have to. So at that point, then, she says, I was a wall, and I have uh, found contentment in my beloved and sort of happily ever after. Now, let's, let's, let's make sure you're with me, right? Because that, that idea of not hearing exactly what the story is saying is a, is a real possibility. So I want to make sure you hear what the story is saying. Bottom line takeaway. If you're a virgin, you're okay. If not, then you're going to have trouble, right? Answer... No, 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 no. <laughs> right? 
No, that's not it. If that's what you heard, listen more carefully. That is not the point here. This is not about God punishing you if you've made mistakes in the past. We've, we've talked about this whole idea with Ecclesiastes. It's not the vision of God you need to have. This is not about God saying, oh, you failed, that's it. You're a second-class citizen now. No, 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 it's not it. What this book is about is the future and building a beautiful marriage now, right? There are no mistakes up to this point that can't be fixed unless you're already married, and then maybe, you know, Maybe it's too late, but, but the, the point is here. This is about the future. Building a beautiful marriage now. How do you do that? Well, here's where we go. Let's just kind of summarize this book from a wisdom standpoint. That's where we are. We're in wisdom. Right? So what it's saying is this. If you are borrowing the future privileges of a covenantal relationship before you're in one, and you understand what that means in the book, then in wisdom terms, you're being a fool. It's a really, really poor idea for a number of reasons. Why? Well, because of this. First of all, let me just say it like this. Sex makes a solid second story to a marriage house, but as a foundation, it's more like sand. It's like a glue that will hold things together, but it's not the foundation. The foundation has to be a solid relationship that can only properly form without the complication or intoxication of sex. Now, listen to this carefully, because this, this is one of the worst dirty little Cedarville secrets that I know. When people get involved physically in their dating, it causes their minds to go a little crazy and they don't think straight. For example, you may not be at all compatible, but you won't even notice. Other friends notice, haven't you seen couples that are together and you think, why are they together? They don't seem to fit. Why are they together? If sex hadn't been involved, you would never have thought, I want to be with this person the rest of my life. And here is the worst secret that you don't hear about because everyone's embarrassed to say it, but I can't tell you how many times I've had couples, serial couples get married, come back, and one of them will say to me six months, a year later, I don't even know why we got married. I didn't even know him. I didn't even know her. And I don't actually like her. Well, there's a reason why you didn't notice that. Because when sex got involved, you lost your mind. And if sex hadn't been involved, you would never have said, boy, I want to spend the rest of my life with this person. Here's the proper order of things, according to G.K. Chesterton. <laughs> One of the most shocking quotes I've ever read. Every man who knocks on the door of a brothel is looking for God. Wait, wait, hold on. That, that's not right. Every man who looks on the door of a brothel is looking. No, no, no. It, if, if God showed up, would you be surprised? Yeah, you'd be surprised, but that's who you're really looking for. Well, what are you talking about? What Chesterton was saying was this, that what you think you're looking for in sex is this intimacy and acceptance by a person. And the truth is what you really need is intimacy and acceptance by God first. Now, that may sound really, really crazy to you, but Chesterton is absolutely right. Jesus says the same thing to the woman at the well. Because we glorify sex, we put too much weight on it when we imagine it will satisfy our hunger for God. And that's exactly where she was. She looks at Jesus and she says, I need the water which you have. And water in the Gospel of John is, is, is perfectly symbolic of this relation, eternal relationship, right? She says, I'm thirsty. I need the water which you have. And Jesus says, yes, you do. But you know what? You need to bring your husband first. And she says, oh, oh I, I don't have a husband. Jesus is not trying to make her feel bad, but he's trying to help her understand reality. He says, you're right, you don't have a husband. In fact, you've had five, right? And, and, and the point is not to make her feel bad, but to make her realize she's been looking for in sex what she could only ultimately find first in God. You were designed for intimacy with God first, and then with another person in the bonds of a marriage covenant. That's so simple. Why is it so hard to get? Do it any other way, and you're following the enemy's shortcut to failure. The order is very simply <clears throat> God, your relationship with him that is good and deeply satisfying, marriage and sex. 
So you say to me at this point, okay, I think I see the message. I guess we've seen that message before. Where does one draw the line? T tell me the thing you can't do. I'll tell you the thing you can't do in the very terms of the book. You know what I'm going to say, right? Do not arouse or awaken love until the right time. So what does that mean? Well, you can probably imagine the kinds of things which arouse love, which stir it up. And if you don't know, go look from 1-2 two to 2-6. Two, because what she's talking about in that very beginning about her relationship with her husband is all those things where love is aroused. And those are the things which she says, don't you dare get involved in these things until the right time. So you might look at that. In fact, I hope you look at that. I hope you look at that and say, that's hard. Because I think Sam Albury was exactly right the other day when he was speaking in chapel and he said, I want to make sure that when I preach about marriage, I get the same response that Jesus did when he preached about marriage. And the people listening said, that's hard, because it is. Yes, that's hard. And I, and I hope you also realize that there is a huge difference, I mean, obviously you do, between our culture and this. And I recognize that. It's not like I'm stupid. Of course I recognize that. But isn't that what we've learned in the wisdom literature? The entire time we've learned this, there are two ways. There are two appeals to youth. In chapter 1 and chapter 9 and all the way through, there are two different options you have. There is wisdom and there is foolishness. You say, wisdom is really hard. I, yeah, I never said it wasn't. Wisdom is hard. Never said it wasn't easy. But it's good. And that's the message of this book. It's not about mistakes in the past. It's about if I'm going to have a relationship that I want to go forward what is it going to look like right now? And what the mother says, what the wife says is, I adjure you three times, here's what you shouldn't do. Don't stir up physical love. There's a good time for that, and it's amazing when it happens, but promise me, you won't do it until the exact right time.